For having me, I uh, really appreciate your honor being here. Uh, I just flew in from, from Sweden where I uh, spent a couple of days working and will continue to Japan to work and then afterwards to Switzerland and UK and it pretty much will continue to travel un until the rest of the year. And there is probably not a, a single day where I don't wake up and I feel really, really thankful of having like a job that I feel very passionate about. Um, and, but also the ability to kind of combine it with like my like for travels. Um, by the way, I became a real travel expert. Um, so this is my topic now. I will talk about packing suitcases for the next 50 minutes. <laughs> but we can take it short. Um, rolling up is the best thing I uh, ended up after experiments after experiments. No, but actually um, what I want to talk about is that um, yeah, like in these last couple of weeks, I've been reflecting a lot about kind of like my lifestyle compared to those of my father. And the thing is like even like projecting to the next generation of family, like three generations, how they, how, how they uh, are different from each other. Um, so my father was born in, in 1930 in, in, in Eastern Europe and um, he was kind of like forced to leave his uh, home and everything he knew at the last weeks of, of World War II. And um, this picture actually is the only picture, or the first picture that exists from him. Um, it's from 1946, um, because everything before that was erased. So um, he had to leave everything. So that's the actually first thing that you have from him, like as a representation. Um, he found a new home at Lake Constance, which is at the border of Switzerland. Um, he married, and uh, I'm the result out of this marriage. So um, yeah, and. Uh, Basically, he was uneducated because of the war, so uh, he was kind of like forced to, to work in a factory and he had the same kind of job for 40 years, almost 40 years, doing the exact thing over and over again. Um, no change at all, 40 years. And this is something that really uh, stro stroked me already as a, as a kid. Like, I couldn't imagine myself feeling happy in this kind of like work environment. There was absolutely no way that I would see myself in, in, such, a, in such a structure. So, I, like my interpretation is um, because he lost so much, um, because he had to leave so, so many things behind, that for him it was so important to basically possess things, to, to work and to uh, save and then be able to afford a, a motorbike or a car or going to vacations, etc., etc. So he accumulated all these things uh, throughout his life and I think the stability with the job, like having the same job together with the possession of objects, that gave some kind of like meaning to, to, to his life. And now, like if I reflect, the first thing that I really possessed of value was this, um, my record collection. Do you guys know what vinyl records are? Or are you are too young? So for, for the older uh, audi uh, guys in the audience, um, so I made pretty much every shitty job in the world to, to be able to afford records. And um, it's hilarious what kind of stuff I had to do in order to buy records back then. But my point is like um, this was the first valuable possession in a physical sense that I had and when I started to work I, I, I moved so often and you can imagine to move these things it's a horror. So I lost a lot of friends in that day, days because um, yeah, you, you, you never can ask a friend twice to move a record collection for you. <laughs> so you can imagine what kind of relief it was for me when, when basically MP3s were invented and I was able to, to rip it all and like to get it uh, a digital. And I have to say uh, in these days even like a physical hard drive seems like a burden to me. So um, you know I'm a big fan of streaming services and I'm trying to digitize as much as possible from my life. So it's not only um, the music, it's the books on the Kindle, it's, it's the movies, the Blu-rays, etc. So the, the less I actually have, the, the better I feel. And this basically continues throughout uh, my life these days. So, um, you know, even a car lost its kind of like status symbol to me. So instead of, actually, uh, that's, I have a car and I'm, uh, that's from 1973, so I'm not able to, to sell it because it's somehow precious, but I don't drive it. So um, this, I, I don't know, the last time I even started the engine, I feel better like to have like this little chip on my driving slice, uh, driver's license and be able to, to go to car sharing and just open it uh, with this chip and have the flexibility. So I don't want to own a, a car in Berlin. And the same, the same goes actually also with my flat. It's, it's, it's most of the times it's, it's up for rent. 
and I got accustomed uh, basically to foreigners sleeping in my bed. <laughs> so probably there are more foreign guys uh, sleeping in my flat than, than I do, and I, I actually feel quite good about it. And again, also the same with the job. Like, I don't want to stick in this job for 40 years. I want to stick in this job as long as I feel passionate about it. And if I don't feel it anymore, I'm able to change. And this is actually the best office environment I can imagine. And I have it all over the world. <laughs> and um, in these situations, I'm, I'm the most creative. Now, um, all this, what I've just described, is of course only possible with the, advan of the advantage of like computing and um, of course, the internet was, was necessary for this kind of lifestyle. And of course, the mobile phone made a, a huge impact. So as we already heard, I mean, this thing is kind of like the centerpiece of our life. I mean, it's, it's kind of like the, the small, as Harald said, remote control to everything around us. And, and, and we basically organize our life around that. So coming back, um, I think basically because he didn't have much choices, um, it's that I value my choices so as a, as a treasure, and this is probably why I'm so yeah like so thrilled to and so thankful for for what I'm able to do. And now just you know thinking uh, uh, the next generation coming up. So this is my daughter. Um, you know I really have a hard time imagining what kind of choices and opportunities she will have, because she's a, a truly digital native and what you already heard um, throughout the day, um, stuff like what you have on the one side, this exponential growth of computing powers, artificial intelligence, robotics, um, 3D printing, variables, etc. cetera. Um, you have this kind of exponential growth, but on the same end, you have these kids growing up, like really naturally working with it. For them, it's like, you know, it's not, nothing new introduced to them. So I think, I mean, you heard so many times about digital natives. For me, the striking thing is, like, most of us know it differently. Like, for instance, with the records, I had to physically ride my bike to a, to a magazine store, which was at a train station, buying a magazine, looking up for inspiration, sending a, a little postcard to a mail order, waiting for two weeks, get a vinyl record played. I mean, how do you describe it to someone like this? I, I had this one, one thing, like when she was about three years old, she was allowed to, to watch her first type of uh, TV content, which is like a, a child series called Caillou, and um, we have like a digital VCR at home. And so she was so used to had, having access to that, so that when we've been to a vacation, to the hotel room, where it was a normal TV, she wanted to watch Caillou, so she looked at me like, yeah, can I watch it? And I'm like, oh. No, because it's actually coming maybe tomorrow on this one channel at six in the morning. And she looked at me like really crying, like, what do you mean? Like, I always, I'm allowed to watch it. What, I did nothing wrong. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I know, but how do I explain to you the concept of, of like, you know, program TV? <laughs> How do I explain it to a three-year-old <laughs> that actually there is a channel with a, with a scheduling and you need to wait for something? So this is my point about these digital natives. <laughs> like we know it differently, they don't know it. And this has like a major, major impact um, on, on anything I can imagine because you can imagine what it means for, for advertising industry, etc. I mean, tell her that she needs to stop looking some, at some piece of content because of advertisement. So there will be a whole generation growing up which will really revolutionize a lot. And so my point is basically um, with the ability to, to operate all these kind of, of technology with, with the stuff that we have, with the universal access to in information wherever they are, for them this access to information comes just as natural as it is for us with electricity. And I think none of us this morning, like in the bathroom, like, you know, uh, putting in like the hair dryer, like, hey, I have electricity. Like it came natural to us. <laughs> and so for, for the little ones, I think it's the access to information that comes so, so natural. So my point is like, you have all this exponential growth on the one hand, you have the digital natives growing up on the other hand, combine it and you have like an amazing future full of opportunities and choices. Thank you. Thank you.